All right, so we're going to start back where we stopped last time on the articles of faith of the uh, church. Um, We're on the subtopic of the Holy Ghost, and we're talking about the Holy Ghost in light of the Scriptures, and we're talking about it in light of what the Bible says about it, not what popular culture says about it, not what the um, feel-gooders say about it, but rather what the Word of God says about it. So, Brother Jack, would you open us up in prayer tonight, Brother? Lord, we just want to thank you for the time we spend together in your word. We just praise and thank you, O Lord. And we ask God to fill the preacher with the help of God. Please do. And let your word go forth. And let it may not come back to the Lord. We just pray, God. And we praise and thank you for everything. In the precious Son of righteous name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Amen. First John chapter two. First John chapter two. We're going to start with verse twenty. Actually, we're going to go back to verse eighteen. Get the context here. Go on down. Little children. Little children, it is the last time. And as you have heard, that Antichrist shall come. He's right here, probably in the wings, waiting to take the world stage as we speak. Even now, are there many Antichrists? Notice that he distinguishes between the Antichrist singular and Antichrist plural. Uh, There's a lot of Antichrist in the world that are not the Antichrist. And there's a lot of people in church history that we look at and say, that's an Antichrist. And you wouldn't be wrong when you say that, but um, in light of Bible prophecy, it may not be the Antichrist. But they're operating under the same spirit. He says, even now are there many Antichrists whereby we know that it is the last time. Now John wrote this back in AD 96, AD 90. And he thought it was the last time then. The last time started with Jesus Christ. See, that's what kicked it off. All right, the Bible says here in verse 19, They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would no doubt have continued with us. But they went out that they might be made manifest that they were not all of us. That's an interesting statement by John because you look at people that come through these church, you know, walls and... I ask, I've had people ask me several times, how can people sit under that church ministry as strong as it is for so long and then just leave like they do? Well, here's the answer. They weren't of us. You know, they can sit there for a while and they take it in for a while, but when the heat gets too hot, they have to leave. Or the Holy Ghost starts dealing with them and then they start moving on out the way. Um... There ain't no doubt about it, folks. If you're a Bible believer, you're going to want to be in a Bible-believing church somewhere. And you're not going to leave a Bible-believing church and go to a charismatic outfit or a um, uh, sugar-coated new version outfit and be comfortable if you're saved. <laughs> but if you ain't saved, you might fit right in over there. But you won't fit in here. You either get right or get out. That's the way it is. That's the way the Bible is saying that this situation will happen. And I see people walk out. I think about this verse all the time, about people coming in and coming out and leaving and turning out being like the devil in the end. They won't never of us. If they had been, they'd have stayed. The Bible says, But ye have an unction from the Holy One, and you know all things. How do you know all things? The Holy Ghost reveals it to you through the Word of God. You got a Bible; it's, it, it, you, you know all things. You already got it. You already got the answer. You may not know where it's at exactly, but it's there, and you know where to go to find it. The Bible says, "I have not written unto you because you know not the truth, but because you know it, and that no lie is of the truth." And you want to highlight that because no lie is of the truth. 
Um, you pick up, and I'm not harping on Bibles today. Don't misunderstand me, but I got to say this. If you got a Bible that's messed up and perverted, it's not of the truth. No lie is of the truth. Now, the devil can give you 98% truth when he comes to you. It's that 2% that's going to kill you. It's that 2% that's going to drive people to hell. He has no problem with people uh, coming around and saying there's a God. That don't bother him at all. He ain't got no problem with people saying, I believe uh, in Jesus. He don't have no problem with that. They don't have, he don't even have a problem with you saying, um, I believe the Bible. <laughs> What he has a problem is when you take those words and do something with them toward God. It's one thing to say I believe the Bible. It's another thing to dig in it and, and start living by it. And letting the word of God get down in your heart. Now he's got a problem. You're getting too close to the thing that he's opposed to. Then you're going to start having trouble. The devil's going to bring trouble your way if you live for him, if you live for the Lord. The Bible says here, you know all things. I have not written unto you because you know not the truth, but because you know it, and that no lies of the truth. Who is a liar but he that denieth that Jesus is the Christ? He is Antichrist that denieth the Father and the Son. You've got to have both. When you're dealing with one that's Pentecostals and people like that, they don't, they don't believe in the Father and the Son as being distinctive persons. But there is a distinction. Jesus, when he was in the garden of Gethsemane, he prayed to the Father. He was not praying to himself. <laughs> he was praying to another member in the Trinity. And that member of the Trinity answered him. They had communication with one another. Alright, the Bible says, Whoever denieth the Son, the same hath not the Father. But he that acknowledgeth the Son hath the Father also. Let that therefore abide in you, notice that, which you have heard from the beginning. Notice that, that, that there, that word that. Let that therefore abide in you, which you have heard from the beginning. That be the word of God. The Bible says here, if that which ye have heard from the beginning shall remain in you, you all shall, shall continue in the Son and in the Father. That's a fact. When the Word of God gets down inside your heart really good, you'll abide with the Father and the Son. You won't turn away from them. You won't deny them. You'll, you'll stand right there with it. Um, I get concerned about what's going to happen here in a little bit when these, um, when these communists wind up over here in the United States with their armies and their militaries. And what all these so-called Christians are going to do when they put a gun to their head and tell them to deny the Lord? Or else. You throw that Bible in this burn pile, or else. Mm-hmm. Yep. I, saw, I see it. I've seen it. I've seen it. Amen. And this is the promise that, you have, that He hath promised us, even eternal life. These things have I written unto you concerning them that seduce you. But the anointing which you have received of him abideth in you. You need not that any man teach you, but as the same anointing teacheth you of all things, and is true, and is no lie, and even as it hath taught you, you shall abide in him. Now I want to make some comments on this verse. Don't take this verse meaning that you don't... Uh, you shouldn't have a, a, a pastor or a, a teacher in your life. He's not saying that. If he was saying that, he would contradict his word because guess what he gave to the church? He gave the church pastors and teachers. Well, if he gave you pastors and teachers in the church, that means you need them. And a pastor and a teacher is supposed to teach you the word of God. But what he's saying is when you get in a situation where there may not be a pastor and a teacher... You know, you're not without guidance. You've got two things in your heart and in your disposal that you can use to get you through. What are they? The Holy Ghost and the Word of God. And as long as you've got those two things, you're good. 
Now, there's Christians out there that don't even have the Word of God at their disposal. But they're still not without help. The Holy Ghost is still there. They can't take the Holy Ghost from you. He's inside of you. And he cannot, he, He's not going to leave you. We've already seen that in previous message on Ephesians chapter uh, 5, or excuse me, chapter 4, verse 30, where he's there till the day of redemption. See? So that anointing will teach you all things. That anointing is the Holy Ghost. Take your Bible and go to Acts chapter 10. Acts chapter 10, verse 38. 28. Acts 10, 38. 38. Yep, Acts 10, 38. The Bible says how God anointed. Look at that word anointed. And this is what the anointing oil, the um, anointing in the Old Testament pictured. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with what? The Holy Ghost and with power. Who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil. For God was with him. That anointing that you find in the scriptures is the Holy Ghost. And the Bible says here in 1 John chapter 2 verse 27. But the anointing which you have received of him abideth in you. You need not that any man teach you. So the Holy Ghost will step in and teach you some things. If you let him. Now the devil's got his entourage out here trying to get you distracted. So you won't hear the Holy Ghost when he's trying to teach you something. He's got all kinds of devices, as the scripture uses the term, out here to get you distracted. Okay? And we need to recognize that. But that same anointing, the Holy Ghost, will teach you of all things and is truth. Well, that would be the Word of God as well, right? The Bible says, Thy word is truth, so and is no lie. All right, and even as they have taught you, you shall abide in Him. All right, now let's go to another one. Let's go to um, Romans chapter 12. Verse 3. Romans 12, verse 3. For I say through the grace given unto me, to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. For as we have, as, excuse me, for as we have many members in one body, and all members have not the same office, so we being many are one body in Christ, and every one members one of another. Having then gifts differing, all right, here comes the gifts. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, whether prophecy let us prophesy according to the proportion of faith. Or ministry, let us wait on our ministering, or he that teacheth on teaching, or he that exhorteth on exhortation, he that giveth, let him do it with simplicity, he that ruleth with diligence, he that showeth mercy with cheerfulness, let love be without dissimulation, abhor that which is evil, cleave to that which is good, be kindly affectionate one to another with brotherly love, and honor preferring one another, not slothful in business, Fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. Rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing instant in prayer, distributing to the necessity of the saints, given to hospitality. Bless them which persecute you, bless and curse not. Rejoice with them that do rejoice, and weep with them that weep. Be of the same mind one toward another, mind not high things, condescend to men of low estate, be not wise in your own conceit. Recompense to no man evil for evil. Provide things honest in our sight of all men. 
If it be possible as much as life in you, live peaceably with all men. And on and on he goes. But wanted to focus over here on these gifts. Notice these gifts. Notice he uses that term gifts there. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Now when you start comparing, you'll notice that there's more gifts there than um, there's gifts in one chapter that's mentioned that's not mentioned in the other one and vice versa. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. I want to show you who gives these gifts and what they're there for. 1 Corinthians chapter 12 verse 1. Now concerning spiritual gifts... What kind of gifts? Spiritual gifts. Spiritual gifts. It's not. It's not gifts that you're born with. I, I get. I get irritated with people um, sometimes in our ranks that think that these uh, spiritual gifts are. They confuse them with natural gifts. There's a big difference between something somebody's quote unquote born with and something that the Lord gives them. Don't confuse the two. Spiritual gifts come from a spiritual source. The Bible says here, concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I would not have you ignorant. Well, a lot of people are ignorant of them. You know that you were Gentiles carried away with under these dumb idols, even as you were led. Wherefore, I give unto you understand that no man speaking by the Spirit of God calleth Jesus accursed, and that no man can say that Jesus is the Lord, but by the Holy Ghost. Let's park there for a minute because I don't think we've talked about that in this series yet. You can not say that Jesus is the Lord except by the Holy Ghost. And when you say the Lord, you're recognizing Him as the Lord excluding everything else. You're recognizing Him as God Almighty manifest in the flesh and revealed and living in your heart. That's the Lord. And there's a lot of people out here in Christian ranks that say, Jesus is Lord, Jesus is Lord, Jesus is Lord. And it sounds like they're saying, well, let me just add Him to all the many other Lords I have in my life already. <laughs> uh, my uh, son-in-law, Jack tried to get him to say, he was talking to him about Jesus. And he tried to get him to say, Be Lord Jesus. Uh-huh. He would never say it. He would come up with something to go all around that. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. He could not say it. He could not say it. Because you got to have the Holy Ghost inside of you to be able to say it. But my uh, daughter, she actually could say it. Yeah. Jesus is the Lord. Or something that was planted in her to let her know that that's the truth. You can't say it except by the Holy Ghost. That's what the verse says. And it's interesting that these big tele- television man- ministries and stuff, the big placard that they put up with the globe, Kenneth Copeland was real popular back in the 70s and 80s doing this. He's still out there, but not as popular as he used to be. He had a big placard behind his pulpit there that said, Jesus is Lord. And every time he would end the broadcast, he would say, Jesus is Lord. You know, like that was saying something. Well, he missed a big key word there. Jesus is the Lord. And that's very important that you recognize the difference there. That's something that a man that's full of the Holy Ghost can say, but not a man that ain't. And there's a lot of people out there that can say Jesus is Lord. As a matter of fact, hold your place there. Go to Philippians. Because I know some people are going to want to run you over here and say, well, it says it over here. Yeah, it does, but it's to a different group. Philippians. Philippians. Now we're looking at chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2. Verse 5. Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robber to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, was made in the likeness of men, and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself, and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore, God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name. Stop right there. He gave him a name which is above every name. Well, that would include the name Jehovah. Philippians chapter 2. 
verse 8 now, or verse uh, 9 now, Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name, which is above every name. It's above every name. That would include Elohim. That would include um, Jehovah. That would include El Shaddai. That would include El. That would include Adonai. That includes the whole bang, shebang, and everything that you can come up with. There's a big movement going on in uh, Christianity right now trying to figure out what the name of God is. And they've got this thing called Yahweh now, which ain't, that there, it's an error. It's not even, that's not even the Hebrew thing for it. But they'll run around and they'll say, Yahweh, Yahweh, it's Yahweh. No, it's not Yahweh, it's Jesus. It's Jesus. English is Jesus. And Jesus is the name that God hath given him, and that's the name above every name. And when you give him the name above every name, you're saying that he is the Lord. Because his name is above Jehovah. Alright, keep reading. The Bible says that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow. Now notice that word should bow of things in heaven and things in earth. And things under the earth. This is a group of things here that are not saved. And that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father before they get cast into hell. Right before they get pitched off into the lake of fire, they're going to have to say Jesus is Lord. As they're going off into the pit. Verse 11. Yeah. And that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Well, what happens to a lost man when he, when he stands before God, brother? What happens to him? What happens to a lost man when he stands before God? He goes off into hell, right? Okay, then what's he got to say before he goes to hell? According to this verse right here. According to verse 11, he's got to say Jesus is Lord. Without the article. He don't have the Holy Ghost in him. He can't say the Lord. See what I'm saying? If he ain't got the Holy Ghost in him, he can't say the Lord, but he can say Lord. Jesus, just like they're all saying right now. <laughs> and they think they're doing it. This stuff is controlled by demonic spirits, folks. They're getting them ready to get to the right, great white throne judgment. So when they get there, they'll say that. Let me show you another passage. Go to Matthew chapter 7. It's not them saying Lord that they're going to have difficulty with. It's saying the Lord. Matthew chapter 7. That's the problem. Look at verse 13. Enter you in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to the where. And many there be which go in thereat, because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few be that find it. Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. You shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? Even so, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. The good fruit is Jesus is the Lord. The bad fruit is, well, we'll acknowledge him, but we're not going to put him on the throne. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast where? Into the fire. Wherefore, by their fruits you shall know them. You can tell them by the fact that they won't say Jesus is the Lord. Not everyone that saith unto me, watch it. What's the next two words say? Lord, Lord. Lord. Shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. But he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord. 
See? Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord. They're going to be forced to say it like that. It's not even something they want to say. But they're going to have to be forced to say it. Have we not done, have we not prophesied in thy name? There's the charismatic movement. And in thy name cast out devils. There's the exorcist of the Vatican. And in thy name done many wonderful works. There's your do-gooders. And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Right before we cast them out. And if you tie those verses together like we just did, you'll see that at the great white throne judgment, right before they're cast there, they're going to have to say that. And then they're going to be cast out. You and I, when we got saved, we had to say, Jesus is the Lord. Look at Romans chapter... This is all about the Holy Ghost, how the real Holy Ghost operates. But you see how subtle Satan is? He'll get you right there to it. But he'll take one word out of it and mess up the whole thing for you. See? Alright. Romans chapter 10. Look at this. Romans chapter 10. You can't be saved without this. You cannot be saved without this. Romans chapter 10 verse 8. But what saith it? The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth, what? See that? The Lord Jesus. Not Lord Jesus. The Lord Jesus. And shalt believe in thy heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. Look at verse 13. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Not whosoever shall call upon Lord, but the Lord. Okay. The definite article determines whether you are to heaven or hell. And you know what the new Bibles do with all these verses? Let me show you. I got two of them right here. Let's see the ESV says in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, shall we? 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And look over here at verse, uh, what was it, 3? Back where we were just at, brother. I'm showing you in a new Bible how they change these verses and pervert them so that you can stay lost, be lost, and go to hell while thinking you're going to heaven. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 3 says this in the uh, ESV. Excuse me. Yeah, verse, is it verse 3? I'm trying to read it in this small print here. Therefore, I want you to understand that no one speaking in the, spirit, in the Spirit of God, notice that, in the Spirit of God, that's the first thing to change, ever says Jesus is accursed. And no one can say Jesus is Lord except in the Holy Spirit. See how they pervert it? <laughs> they pervert it so bad that they got you over there in Philippians. Making the confession of a lost man. NIV is no better. It says the same thing in NIV. I'll read it to you, just just for laughs and giggles. Uh, first. Well, how do they change it in Romans then? So... That's a good question. Let's look at it. Let's see what Romans 10 says here. Romans 10. Let's see what they do with it there. <laughs> same thing. <laughs> they do the same thing. Birds of a feather flock together. Look over here in Romans 10. And look at what they do with this now. They do the same thing. In verse 9, that if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord. <laughs> and believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. No, you won't. <laughs> 
In 1 Corinthians chapter, that was the NIV I just read. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. See, the King James has got to be giving you a revelation in there that you don't have in the new Bibles. It makes a distinctive, it makes a division. And one three-letter word can determine who's saved and who's not, who's got the Holy Ghost and who don't. 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and a NIV says the same thing. Therefore I tell you that no one who is speaking by the Spirit of God says Jesus is cursed and no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. That's your two Bibles that are recommended by Bob Jones University, Tennessee Temple, and uh, Sword of the Lord, and all the rest of that trash out there that's out there running around peddling new Bibles. All right, let's get back to this now. Let's go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 12 here. That's why I keep them over there in case somebody doubts what I'm saying. Um, these new Bibles are very subtle in how they do things. They'll take one three-letter word out that can determine where you go forever and make you think that you're right. All right, First Corinthians chapter 12. Now there are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. Verse 5, and there are differences of administrations, but the same Lord. And there are diversities of operations, but it is the same God which worketh all in all. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit with all. For the one is given by the Spirit the word of wisdom. Where do you get your wisdom from? All right. To another the word of knowledge by the same Spirit. Where do you get your knowledge from? The Bible. To another faith. Where do you get your faith from? By the same Spirit. To another, the gifts of healing by the same Spirit. He sent His Word and healed them. To another, the working of miracles. To another, prophecy. To another, discerning of spirits. To another, diverse kinds of tongues. And to another, the interpretation of tongues. But all these worketh that one and self same Spirit, dividing to every man severally as he will. Now notice he uses dividing there twice. He uses it there in verse 11. And he also uses it there in, uh, let's see, I just read it. <laughs> discerning of spirits. No, I'm sorry. It was discerning of spirits. But there are diversities. That's what it is. Diversities is what I was thinking about. All right. Now, I'm not going to get in detail on these gifts of the Spirit here uh, today. But what I do want you to understand is the real gifts of the Spirit come from the Holy Ghost. And the Holy Ghost determines who gets those gifts, how they operate, and what they do in your life. Okay? But the thing I do want you to take away from these verses here, and these specific verses here that we just read, is every one of those gifts down here from verse 8 down to verse 11 are connected to the Word of God. In the early church before the canon of the Holy Scriptures was given, these gifts were operating and they were pushing and pointing people to the Holy Scriptures. Think about it for a minute. The word of wisdom. You get that from the Scriptures according to Proverbs. The word of knowledge. You get that from the Scriptures according to Proverbs. And then you've got the faith here. Faith cometh by hearing, Romans ten seventeen. To another the gifts of healing. By the same Spirit, He sent His Word and healed them. To another, the working of miracles. To another, prophecy. We prophesy every time we open this Bible and tell you where you're going when you die. You know you prophesy when you do that, Brother Jack? Where are you going when you die? You're going where? You're going to be with the Lord? See, He's prophesying. Has that happened yet? Is it going to happen? Is it a sure word of prophecy? What's he basing it on? The Word of God. See what I mean? That's prophecy. Prophecy is not standing up here and saying, all right, folks, God revealed to me that you're going to have a brand new car next week and uh, 
you know, you're going to get lots of money. And uh, if you give to this ministry and so, so to this ministry, you know, God's going to bless and prosper. That's not prophecy. That's witchcraft. <laughs> and most of, most of what's going on in churches today is witchcraft. And they're calling it prophecy. And get up there and get the jerks and the shakes and they think that's the Holy Ghost. That's not the Holy Ghost. That's a manifestation of demonic spirits. Because every time they open their mouth, they say something contrary to the Word of God. And the Holy Ghost will never contradict the Word of God. I don't care how much you shake, jump, run, shake, roll around on the floor, bark like a dog, howl like a wolf. If you're speaking with your mouth something contrary to the Word of God, that is not the Holy Ghost. It's not. Alright, diverse kinds of tongues, and I don't mean jibber-jabber. I mean tongues. I mean real languages. It's supernaturally God gives you to speak to somebody something in another language to get them the gospel and to get them to know who Jesus Christ is. That's the, whole, that's the work of the Holy Ghost. Remember, the Holy Ghost does not speak of Himself. I showed you all that in previous lessons. He does not speak of Himself. He speaks of Jesus Christ. He glorifies Christ. He glorifies Christ's name. That's the Holy Ghost. Holy Ghost is not out here trying to get you to center all your attention on Him. It's not the Holy Ghost. Alright. We'll, we'll revisit that a little bit more later. Alright, let's go to Ephesians chapter 4. Because we got a whole chapter in 1 Corinthians chapter uh, 14 that deals with gifts and chapter 13, but we'll revisit those later on. And we'll talk about the charismatic movement in great detail. Alright. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 7. We'll make some more enemies. <laughs> ain't like I ain't got enough already. Alright. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 7. But unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Wherefore he saith when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. Now notice he led captivity those that were captive down there in the lower parts of the earth, he brought them up, but he also captured, he, he captured them. They didn't lose their captivity. They just switched masters. <laughs> you went from one uh, plantation to another. You went from the devil's house to the Lord's house. That's right. They were in Abraham's bosom. That's right. And they were brought out of that and where were they brought to? But where did they go? That's that's what I'm preaching. <laughs> that's what I'm saying. They went from one place to another. They were held captive down in the lower parts of the earth. And they went up. See? When you got saved, you were in Satan's kingdom, right? Were you or were you not? Were you not in the kingdom of darkness? You were held captive to him by his will, okay? And when you got out of that and went and got in the Lord's kingdom, did you stop being a servant? You became a servant of Jesus Christ, right? That's, that's right. He's our master now. Jesus told the disciples, he said, one is your master, Jesus. He was pointing to himself when he said that. He's our master, Call no man on earth your master, for one is your master. And Jesus Christ is that master. That's in the Gospels. It's in Matthew. You want to see it? Alright. All right, let me find it for you. Alright. Take your Bible and let's look over here at. I'm going to take me a minute here to find it. Hold on just a minute. Matthew 23, 8. Matthew 23, 8. Hold your place here. We're going to come back. I ain't done there yet. Matthew 23, 8.
Verse 8, Be not ye called my, uh, rabbi, for one is your master, even who? Christ. And all your brethren. See that thing? So who's your master? Who's your master? <laughs> Thank you. Y'all, y'all quiet there. It does exist, it's called nowhere as his master, right? Look at verse 10. It does in verse 10. Neither be ye called masters, for one is your master, even Christ. Alright. There it is. Alright, go back to Ephesians. Alright. Ain't nothing like a King James Bible to straighten out a misunderstanding. <laughs> Ephesians chapter 4 again. Let's look at this. No worries. Verse 10. He that descended is the same also that ascended up far above all heavens, that he might feel all things. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man and unto the, excuse me, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Now notice what these gifts are given for. Verse 12. For the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Now if those things aren't present in the gifts giving and the uh, operation of the ministry gifts, then they're not gifts that come from the Holy Ghost. There's no such thing as a gift that causes you to bark and howl. Now y'all laugh at that or you kind of look strange at me of that. There are preachers teaching that today. How for the Lord, that's a gift of the Spirit that God has revealed in the last days to His church. Now that's blasphemy and that's not of God. That's a demonic thing. When you start acting like animals, you're getting over there into the spirit realm for sure, but you're not getting over there into the realm of the Spirit of God. You're getting over there into that other kingdom where there are animals, but they're unclean spirits. That's what you're operating under. All right, let's go to another one here. Let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 12. 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Look at verse 12 there. Now here, we're looking at, and again, we're just looking at these for right now. I'm going to give you some more details on these later on the apostolic sign gifts. Uh, some of these sign gifts are found in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, and some of them are found in 1 Corinthians chapter 14. And here's some uh, other ones here in verse 12 of 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Truly the signs of what? Now notice the term there, signs. Signs of an apostle were wrought among you in all patience, in signs and wonders and mighty deeds. So there's things that the apostles were able to do that you're not able to do. And there's things there that they were doing under the work of the Holy Spirit that you are not able to do. Now first question I want you to ask yourself when it comes to signs, who are sign who requires a sign? Amen. The Jews. Take your Bible and look at 1 Corinthians. And look over here at verse 22. Okay. Chapter 1, I'm sorry. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 22. The nation of Israel started out with signs. That's how they were born. That's how they started. When they came out of Egypt, it came out of Egypt through the sign gifts being given through Moses. That's how they were born. And ever since they started as a nation, they require a sign. According to verse 22, for the Jews require a sign. Now what are the sign gifts of the apostles given to the Jews? Go to Mark chapter 16.
Christ. Mark 16. These signs and gifts are going to show up in the millennium. Again, when the apostles are present. Alright, Mark chapter 16, look at verse, um, let's start down here at verse 15. Now he said unto him, Go ye in all the world. Now who's the ye there? He said unto them, Who's the them? The way you find out who the them is, you've got to look at verse 14. Afterward he appeared unto what? Who did he appear to in verse 14? There you go. That's the apostles, right? Alright, and verse 15 is aimed at them. He said unto them, Go ye in all the world, preach the gospel to every creature. Did the apostles accomplish that? Did they preach the gospel to every creature? Mm -mm, they didn't. But a commission was given to them to. He told them this in verse 16. He said, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. And look at verse 17. And these what? Shall follow them that believe. In my name they shall cast out devils. They shall speak with unknown tongues. Is that what it says? It says new tongues. I'm going to show you what that is in a minute. They shall take up serpents. If they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick. They shall recover. <clears throat> no faith required on the part of the uh, sick. Notice that. It says they shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. So these fakers that run around and tell you the reason so and so didn't get healed is because they didn't have enough faith or just lying to you. According to these verses, if you're going to use these verses as a, a proof text to show that you can do what you claim you can do, then the verse says that if you lay hands on them, they'll, they'll get up and they'll, they'll be well. So every time I run around one of these fakers, I ask them, I said, uh, are you an apostle? And they say, yeah. Uh, do you have the gift of healing? They'll say, yeah. Do you have the gift of miracles? Yeah. Okay, let's get the car with me real quick. Where are we going? <laughs> We're going down to the hospital. Why are we going there? Who are we going to see? Oh, we're just going to run up and down the aisles there, the uh, cancer ward, and we're going to go up and down the aisles there in the ICU unit, and I'm going to get you to lay hands on everybody in there, and they're going to get up and get out. Oh, we can't do that. Why not? You said you're an apostle. Why not? You said you had to get the healing. According to these verses here, if you lay hands on the sick, they shall recover. What's the matter? You ain't got a camera stuck in your face, so you can't perform? <laughs> that's their problem they are running around with the camera stuck in their face and they got everything staged See, to make you think that they got something that they don't have alright the Bible says here that they shall recover now let's look at these verses in detail for a minute we're going to take some time let's see what time we got maybe we can let's see yeah we should have time all right, you see that first part there where it says, In my name they shall cast out devils? Go to Zechariah chapter 13. During the millennium, verses 17 through 18 will be fulfilled in the following ways. In my name they shall cast out devils. Remember, all of this is being done by the Holy Ghost. Zechariah 13. And the apostles will be there during the millennium, by the way. Alright, Zechariah chapter 13, verses 1 and 2. The Bible says, In that day there shall be a fountain open to the house of David and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem for sin and for uncleanness. And it shall come to pass in that day, saith the Lord of hosts, that I will cut off the names of the idols out of the land, they shall no more be remembered. And also, watch it, I will cause the prophets and the unclean spirit to pass out of the land. And if you look at Matthew chapter 12, verses 43 through 45, and Revelation 19, 20, and, and uh, Revelation chapter 12, that unclean spirit has a plural nature to it. See? 
And when Jesus is dealing with the unclean spirit that was in a man over there in Matthew, he asked the man, he says, what is thy name? And that unclean spirit said, my name is Legion, for we, we are many. So he has a plural nature to him, and yet he's singular. He's just like God. God has a plural nature to him, yet he's singular. It's one God that we worship, right? And yet there are the seven spirits of God who manifest himself as a trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. There's three there that bear record in heaven. Alright? Satan also has a plural nature to him. He has a plural nature that manifests itself in the book of Revelation as a seven-headed dragon. Isn't that interesting that he's got seven heads and God's got seven spirits? <laughs> Alright, so there's your, uh, in, in my name they shall cast out devils. Satan has a plural nature about him. I showed you that in Matthew 12, 43-45. Now notice this next part. They shall speak with new tongues. Go to Zephaniah. Go to the left if you're not sure where that's at. From Zechariah, go to the left. Zephaniah chapter 3 verse 9. They're going to speak with new tongues. The Bible says... Zephaniah 3, what? Uh, let's start with verse 8, brother. Okay. Verse 8. Therefore wait ye upon me, saith the Lord, until the day that I rise up to the prey. For my determination is to gather the nations that I may assemble the kingdoms. There's your United Nations. To pour upon them mine indignation, even all my fierce anger, for all the earth shall be devoured with the fire of my jealousy. For then will I turn to the people a pure language. There it is that they may all call upon the name of the Lord to serve Him with one consent. There's that pure language. Go to Isaiah chapter 19, verse 18. He's going to clean up that Hebrew language. That's going to be a pure new language. So when the people, plural, are speaking, they're going to be speaking in new tongues. They're going to be speaking the new language, the pure language that God purifies during the millennium. Look at verse 18. And that day shall five cities in the land of Egypt speak the language of what? Canaan. 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 That's, that's an Israel. And swear to the Lord of hosts, one shall be called the city of destruction. And that day shall there be an altar to the Lord in the midst of the land of Egypt, and a pillar at the border thereof to the Lord. Alright, there's your language. And that has nothing to do with the charismatics running around, trying to convince you that they got the Spirit of God by talking in some unknown gibberish called, that they call tongues. All right, they shall take up serpents. Go to Isaiah chapter 11. Isaiah chapter 11. Look at verse 8. They're going to take up serpents. When are they going to do that? That ain't got nothing to do with these... Churches up in the mountains that are running around dancing around with snakes. I used to preach in some of those churches. I've been to snake handling churches. I, I preached in some of them. <laughs> Back in the day before I knew what I know now. But he's not talking about people picking up serpents in their hands in the church age and dancing around with them in the church trying to prove that they got faith in God. A lot of those people wind up getting bit and die. Here's what he's talking about. Isaiah chapter 11, look at verse 8. The Bible says in verse 8, well, let's get, let's get some context. So let me go back a few verses. Uh, let's see. Let me see. Let me see. Let me see. Let me see. All right, let's go back here to verse 6. The wolf also shall dwell with the lamb, and the leopard shall lie down with the kid, 
and the calf and the young lion and the fatling together, and a little child shall lead them. This is after righteousness shall be in the land. Look at verse 4. But with righteousness shall he judge the poor and reprove with equity for the meek of the earth. He shall smite the earth with the rod of his mouth and with the breath of his lips shall he slay the wicked. And righteousness shall be the girdle of his loins and faithfulness the girdle of his reins. Alright, now go down to verse 7. We just read verse 6. And the cow and the bear shall feed their young ones. Uh, Excuse me. The cow and the bear shall feed, their young ones shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. And the sucking child shall play on the hole of the asp. What's an asp? There you go. And the wean child shall put his hand on the cockatrice den. Anybody know what a cockatrice is? It's a type of serpent. <laughs> type of serpent. Sure. Type of serpent. Mm-hmm. Yeah. A cockatrice then. Then they shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain. For the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. And in that day there shall be a root of Jesse, which shall stand for an ensign of the people. To it shall the Gentiles seek, and his rest shall be glorious. That's the millennial reign of Jesus Christ. When he's in the land. The children will be able to play on with the serpents. They'll pick up serpents and they will not be hurt. That's exactly what Jesus Christ says here in Mark chapter 16 verse 18. They shall take up serpents and if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. So let's look at a couple more things here. If they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. Isaiah chapter 11 verse 9 says, They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. And if you want some more verses on that, you can look at Matthew 26, 29, Mark 14, 25, Isaiah 55, 1 through 3, Deuteronomy 32, 33, Amos chapter 9 verse 13, Romans 8, Excuse me, Revelation 8, 11, and 2 Kings 4, 38 through 41. The next part he says here is they shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. Go to Matthew 10, 5. Matthew 10, 5. This is a commission to the uh, 12, and it's given to them to go to the Jews, not the Gentiles. And it's a commission that's going to be reinstated during the millennium. Look at verse 5. These 12 Jesus sent forth and commanded them, saying, Go not in the way of the Gentiles. And in any city of the Samaritans enter ye not, but rather, but go rather to where? The, of where? And as ye go preach, saying, The kingdom of heaven, and I don't mean God, is at hand. Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out devils. Freely ye have received, freely give. Provide neither gold, nor silver, nor brass in your purses, nor scripts. I think it's funny some of these preachers try to make these verses here apply to them, these charismatics. I say, well, what are you going to do with verse 10? It tells you not to carry a Bible. <laughs> the commission that God gave them here says that they don't even take a script with them. Do you carry a Bible with you when you go? Well, if you're going to make these verses apply to you, then you couldn't carry a Bible. What's that thing you're holding in your hand? Is it not called the Holy Scriptures? <laughs> the Bible says here, nor script for your journey, neither two coats, nor shoes, nor yet stays, for the workman is worthy of his meat. And then he goes out there and he tells them what to do. Alright? Let's look at another verse here. Go to Malachi 4 2. Malachi 4 2.
Alright, Malachi 4.2 The Bible says, But unto you that fear my name shall the Son of Righteousness arise with healing in his wings and you shall go forth and grow up as calves of the stall. When is that going to take place? Look at verse 1. For behold, the day cometh that shall burn as an oven and all the proud, yea, and all that do wickedly shall be stubble. And the day that cometh shall burn them up, saith the Lord of hosts, that it shall leave them neither root nor branch. That's the second advent of Jesus Christ when he's given it, ready to come in and establish the kingdom. And look at what verse uh, 3 says. And ye shall tread down the wicked. They shall be ashes under your feet, under the soles of your feet. In the day that I shall do this, saith the Lord of hosts. Remember ye the law of Moses, my servant. So they're back under the law. Which I commanded unto him in horror for all Israel with the statutes and judgments. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to their fathers. Lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. Go to Psalm chapter 103. In the church age, you're not guaranteed healing. Now God heals in answer to prayer. I believe that. Or else I wouldn't pray for nobody. <laughs> I believe that God will heal people in answer to prayer according to His will. And we're in obedience to God by anointing them with oil and laying hands on them. We're supposed to do that. But these verses here that we're tackling tonight are dealing with people that when they put their hands on people, they come up off the floor. If they're sick and unable to walk, they come up, they're healed, they're restored immediately, and there ain't no faith to it. And you've got to understand where these verses apply doctrinally in this dispensational thing here. And that's what I'm showing you. They apply to the church in the millennium and the children of Israel receiving this healing by Jesus Christ. Now, look at this one in Psalm 103. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless His holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all His benefits. Who forgiveth all thine iniquities and who healeth, watch it, all thy diseases. Has He done that to you in the church age? You could argue he done the first part, but how about the second part? No. Different group then. The Bible says, Who redeemeth thy life from destruction? Brother Jack, has your life been redeemed from destruction? Well, has your life, your physical body, has it been redeemed from destruction? Are you going to live or die in the next little while? Okay. Alright, so then that would, that would not apply to you then. Who crowneth thee with loving kindness and tender mercies? Who satisfieth thy mouth with good things? Anybody here had a toothache? Anybody here had a tooth extraction? Anybody here had any mouth problems with uh, your teeth bothering you? I have. Got some things going on right now. But this verse says, He satisfies your mouth with good things, so that thy youth is renewed like the eagles. Well, I'm 49 years old. My youth ain't been renewed like the eagles yet. The Lord executed righteousness and judgment for all that are oppressed. He made known His ways unto Moses, His acts unto the children of Israel. I didn't read anywhere in those two verses where it said church, church age, Christians, born again, body of Christ, saved believers, King James Bible believers or anything like that. I heard Moses, children of Israel. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger, plenteous in mercy. He will not always chid, neither will he keep his anger forever. He has not dealt with us after our sins, nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. For as the heaven is higher above the earth, so great is his mercy toward them that fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far hath he removed our transgressions from us. That's a prophecy in the Old Testament. That did not happen in the Old Testament. It happened in the New Testament when Jesus went to the cross. Like as a father pitieth his children, so the Lord pitieth them that fear him. For he knoweth our frame and remembereth that we are dust. 
But as for man, his days are grass, as flower of the field, so he flourisheth. For the wind passeth over it and is gone, the place thereof shall know it no more. But the mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting upon them that fear him. And his righteousness unto children's children, to such as keep his covenant, and to those that remember his commandments, to do them. Is that you? Do you keep the commandments of the Old Testament? <laughs> the Lord hath prepared his throne in the heavens, his kingdom ruleth over all. Bless the Lord, ye, his, ye angels, that excel in strength, that do His commandments, hearkening to the voice of His word. Bless ye the Lord, all ye His hosts, ye ministers of His, that do His pleasure. Bless the Lord, all His works, in all the places of His dominion. Bless the Lord, O my soul. You know where that's applying to? Doctrinally, the millennium. That's where this stuff is going to happen. And when Jesus gives you that in Mark chapter 16, and the reason the scholars take Mark 16 and take those verses out is because they can't figure out how that would work in the church age when it won't even aimed at the church age. During the tribulation period, the Jewish evangelists will do all of the above as well. This will include drinking any deadly thing. Revelation chapter 8. This is where I'm closing. Revelation 8. They're going to drink a, something deadly. Revelation 8, 10 through 10, 11. You see where it says they shall drink any deadly thing it will not hurt them? You say, where's that at in the Bible? I'm getting very short to you. Look at verse 8. Revelation 8, 8. And the second angel sounded, and as it were, a great mountain burning with fire was cast into the sea. The third part of the sea became blood. And the third part of the creatures which were in the sea and had life died. And the third part of the ships were destroyed. And the third angel sounded, and there fell a great star from heaven, burning as it were as a lamp. And it fell upon the third part of the rivers and upon the fountains of waters. And the name of the star is called Wormwood. And the third part of the waters became wormwood, and many men died of the waters because they were made bitter. Notice it says many men died. But those that honor God during the tribulation period and the Jewish evangelists and the converts and the Jewish remnant, they won't die. You know why? Because if they drink any deadly thing, it will not hurt them. They're supernaturally being protected by God. That don't mean you run around and drink strychnine. <laughs> That's it, brothers and sisters, tonight. That's all I got for you um, on that. I won't even plan on getting into all that on Mark 16, but I felt like you might want to put that in your repertoire of things that you need to know on the gifts of the Spirit and the apostolic sign gifts and how they work and who they apply to. When the apostles are here, they're dealing with the Jews. The only apostle that dealt with the Gentiles is Paul. And he was not one of the twelve. I don't know if you noticed that when you read your Bible. They appointed another apostle in the book of Acts for the twelve. You got the Jewish twelve that are dealing with Israel. And then you got the one apostle to the Gentiles. And he covered the whole shebang for us. And when you're dealing with apostles, they're dealing with uh, the sign gifts. They're dealing with Jews. And when Paul was going to the Jews, those apostolic sign gifts were manifest. When he's dealing with the Gentiles, he's dealing with them on the level of wisdom and knowledge and understanding. Because that's you and I. That's what we deal with. We reason. <laughs> All right. Anybody got any questions on this tonight? Did you learn? Excuse me. Did you learn anything? We went about 12 minutes over. That'd be all right. I learned more than I did in 40 years of being First Baptist Church. There you go. Well, that's a, that's a blessing. <laughs> Amen. All right. Well, let's close in prayer tonight. Father, we thank you for your blessings tonight. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for your mercy. We thank you for your goodness. Take these things we've studied out of your word tonight. We meditate on them this week. Think on them. Ponder them. And may it help us to grow in our work and our walk with you, Lord. We ask it all in Jesus' name. Keep us safe till we come together again, we pray. Amen.